Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. We begin this episode in a slightly different way. Although it is a non-fiction episode, with all the stories being true, I am going to start with a fictional story by M. R. James, entitled Lost Hearts. You'll understand why as we get through the episode. It was, as far as I can ascertain, in September of the year 1811 that a post-chase drew up before the door of Aswarby Hall in the heart of Lincolnshire. The little boy who jumped out as soon as it had stopped looked about him with the keenest curiosity during the short interval that elapsed between the ringing of the bell and the opening of the hall door. He saw a tall, square, red brick house built in the reign of Anne a stone-pillared porch had been added in the purest classical style of 1790. The windows of the house were many, tall and narrow with small panes and thick white woodwork. A pediment pierced with a round window crowned the front. There were wings to right and left, connected by curious glazed galleries supported by colonnades with the central block. These wings plainly contained the stables and offices of the house, each was surmounted by an ornamental cupola with a gilded vane. An evening light shone on the building, making the window panes glow like so many fires. Away from the hall in the front stretched a flat park studded with oaks and fringed with firs which stood out against the sky. The clock in the church tower, buried in trees on the edge of the park, only its golden weathercock catching the light, was striking six and the sound came gently beating down the wind. It was altogether a pleasant impression, though tinged with a sort of melancholy appropriate to an evening in early autumn that was conveyed to the mind of the boy who was standing in the porch waiting for the door open to him. The post-chase had brought him from Warwickshire, where some six months before he'd been left an orphan. Now, owing to the generous offer of his elderly cousin, Mr. Abney, he had come to live at Aswarby. The offer was unexpected because all who knew anything of Mr. Abney looked upon him as a somewhat austere recluse into whose steady-going household the advent of a small boy would import a new and it seemed incongruous element. The truth is that very little was known of Mr. Abney's pursuits or temper. The professor of Greek at Cambridge had been heard to say that no one knew more of the religious beliefs of the later pagans than did the owner of Asmorby. Certainly his library contained all the then-available books bearing on the mysteries, the Orphic poems, the worship of Mithras, and the Neoplatonists. In the marble-paved hall stood a fine group of Mithras slaying a bull which had been imported from the Levant at great expense by the owner. He had contributed a description of it to the gentleman's magazine, and he'd written a remarkable series of articles in the Critical Museum on the superstitions of the Romans of the Lower Empire. He was looked upon, in fine, as a man wrapped up in his books, and it was a matter of great surprise among his neighbors that he should even have heard of his cousin Stephen Elliott, much more that he should have volunteered to make him an inmate of Aswarby Hall. Whatever may have been expected by his neighbors, it is certain that Mr. Abney, the tall, thin, the austere, seemed inclined to give his young cousin a kindly reception. The moment the front door was opened, he darted out of his study, rubbing his hands with delight. "'How are you, my boy? How are you? How old are you?' said he. "'That is, you're uh, not too much tired, I hope, by your journey to eat your supper?' "'No, thank you, sir.' said Master Elliot. I'm pretty well. That's a good lad, said Mr. Abney. And how old are you, my boy? It seemed a little odd that he should have asked the question twice in the first two minutes of their acquaintance. I'm twelve years old next birthday, sir, said Stephen. And when is your birthday, my dear boy? Eleventh of September, eh? That's well, that's very well. Nearly a year hence, isn't it? 
I like. <laughs> I like to get these things down in my book. Sure it's twelve? Certain? Yes, quite sure, sir. Well, well. Take him to Mrs. Bunch's room, Parks, and let him have his tea. Supper, whatever it is. Yes, sir, answered the staid Mr. Parks and conducted Stephen to the lower regions. Mrs. Bunch was the most comfortable and human person whom Stephen had as yet met in Oswarby. She made him completely at home. They were great friends in a quarter of an hour, and great friends they remained. Mrs. Bunch had been born in the neighborhood some fifty-five years before the date of Stephen's arrival, and her residence at the hall was of twenty years' standing. Consequently, if anyone knew the ins and outs of the house and the district, Mrs. Bunch knew them and she was by no means disinclined to communicate her information. Certainly there were plenty of things about the hall and the hall gardens which Stephen, who was of an adventurous and inquiring turn, was anxious to have explained to him. Who built the temple at the end of the Laurel Walk? Who was the old man whose picture hung on the staircase, sitting at a table with a skull under his hand? These and many similar points were cleared up by the resources of Mrs. Bunch's powerful intellect. There were others, however, of which the explanations furnished were less than satisfactory. One November evening, Stephen was sitting by the fire in the housekeeper's room, reflecting on his surroundings. "'Is Mr. Abney a good man, and will he go to heaven?' he suddenly asked with the peculiar confidence which children possess in the abilities of their elders to settle these questions, the decision of which is believed to be reserved for other tribunals. "'Good bless the child,' said Mrs. Bunch. "'Master's as kind a soul as ever I see. Didn't I never tell you of the little boy as he took in out of the street, as you may say, this seven years back, and the little girl two years after I first come here?' "'No. Do tell me about them, Mrs. Bunch.' now, this minute. Well, said Mrs. Bunch, the little girl I don't seem to recall so much about. I know Master brought her back with him from his walk one day and, and give orders to Mrs. Ellis, as was housekeeper then, as she should be took every care with. And the poor child had no one belonging to her. She tell me so herself, and here she lived with us a matter of three weeks, it might be, and then, whether she were something of a gypsy in her blood or what not, but one morning she out of her bed before any of us had opened an eye, and neither track nor yet trace of her have I set eyes on since. Master was wonderful put about and had all the ponds dragged, but it's my belief she had her way by them gypsies, for there was singing round the house for as much as an hour the night she went, and Parks, he declared he heard them a-calling in the woods all that afternoon. Dear, dear, Ah, hard child she was, so silent in her ways and all, but I was wonderful taken up with her, so domesticated she was. Surprising. And what about the little boy? said Stephen. Ah, that poor boy, sighed Mrs. Bunch. He were a foreigner. Jeveny, he called himself, and he come a-tweaking his hurdy-gurdy round and about to drive one winter day and master at him in that minute and asked all about where he came from, and how old he was, and, and how he made his way, and, and, and where, where was his relatives, and all as kind of heart could wish. But it went the same way with him. They're a unruly lot, them foreign nations, I do suppose, and he was off one fine morning just the same as the girl. Why, he went, and, and what he done was our question for as much as a year after, for he never took his early gurdy and there it lays on the shelf." The remainder of the evening was spent by Stephen in miscellaneous cross-examination of Mrs. Bunch and in efforts to extract a tune from the hurdy-gurdy. That night, he had a curious dream. At the end of the passage, at the top of the house in which his bedroom was situated, there was an old, disused bathroom. It was kept locked, but the upper half of the door was glazed, and since the muslin curtains which used to hang there had long been gone, you could look in and see the lead-lined bath affixed to the wall on the right-hand side, with its head toward the window. On the night of which I'm speaking, Stephen Elliott found himself, as he thought, looking through the glazed door. The moon was shining through the window, and he was gazing at a figure which lay in the bath. 
His description of what he saw reminds me of what I once beheld myself in the famous vaults of St. Mission's Church in Dublin, which possesses the horrid property of preserving corpses from decay for centuries. A figure inexpressibly thin and pathetic of a dusty, leaden color enveloped in a shroud-like garment, the thin lips crooked into a faint and dreadful smile, the hands pressed tightly over the region of the heart. As he looked upon it, a distant, almost inaudible moan seemed to issue from its lips, and the arms began to stir. The terror of the sight forced Stephen backwards, and he awoke to the fact that he was indeed standing on the cold boarded floor of the passage in the full light of the moon. With a courage which I do not think could be common among boys of his age, he went to the door of the bathroom to ascertain if the figure of his dream were really there. It was not and he went back to bed. Mrs. Bunch was much impressed next morning by his story and went so far as to replace the muslin curtain over the glazed door of the bathroom. Mr. Abney, moreover, to whom he confided his experiences at breakfast, was greatly interested and made notes of the matter in what he called his book. The spring equinox was approaching, and Mr. Abney frequently reminded his cousin adding that this had been always considered by the ancients to be a critical time for the young, that Stephen would do well to take care of himself and shut his bedroom window at night, and that Sensorinus had some valuable remarks on the subject. Two incidents that occurred about this time made an impression upon Stephen's mind. The first was after an unusually uneasy and depressed night that he had passed, though he could not recall any particular dream that he had had. The following evening, Mrs. Bunch was occupying herself in mending his nightgown. "'Gracious me, Master Stephen!' she broke forth rather irritably. "'How do you manage to tear your nightdress all to flinders this way? Look here, sir, what trouble you do give to poor servants that have to darn and mend after you!' There was indeed a most destructive and apparently wanton series of slits or scorings in the garment, which would undoubtedly require a skillful needle to make good. They were confined to the left side of the chest, long, parallel slits, about six inches in length, some of them not quite piercing the texture of the linen. Stephen could only express his entire ignorance of their origin. He was sure that they were not there the night before. But, he said, Mrs. Bunch, they're just the same as the scratches on the outside of my bedroom door, and I'm sure I never had anything to do with making them. Mrs. Bunch gazed at him, open-mouthed, then snatched up a candle, departed hastily from the room, and was heard making her way upstairs. In a few minutes, she came down. Well, she said, Master Stephen, it's a funny thing to me how them marks and scratches can have come there, too high up for any cat or dog to have made them, much less a rat, for all the world like Chinaman's fingernails, as my uncle in the tea tray used to tell us of when we was girls together. I wouldn't say nothing to Master, not if I was you, Master Stephen. My dear, and just turn the key of your door when you go to your bed. I always do, Mrs. Bunch, as soon as I've said my prayers. Ah, that's a good child. Always say your prayers, and then no one can hurt you. Herewith, Mrs. Bunch addressed herself to mending the injured nightgown, with intervals of meditation, until bedtime. This was on a Friday night in March 1812. On the following evening, the usual duet of Stephen and Mrs. Bunch was augmented by the sudden arrival of Mr. Parks, the butler, who as a rule kept himself rather to himself in the pantry. He did not see that Stephen was there, he was moreover flustered, and less slow of speech than was his wont. "'Master may get up his own wine if he likes of an evening,' was his first remark. "'Either I do it in the daytime or not at all, Mrs. Bunch.' I don't know what it may be, very like it's the rats or the wind got into the cellars, but I'm not as young as I was and I can't go through with it as I have done. Well, Mr. Parks, you know it is a surprising place for the rats, is the hall. I'm not denying that, Mrs. Bunch, and to be sure many a time I've heard the tale from the men in the shipyards about the rat that could speak. 
I never laid no confidence in that before, but tonight, if I'm deemed myself to lay my ear to the door of the further bin, I could pretty much have heard what they were saying. Oh there, Mr. Parks, I've no patience with your fancies. Rats talking in the wine cellar indeed. Well, Mrs. Bunch, I've no wish to argue with you. All I say is, if you choose to go to the far bin and lay your ear to the door, you may prove my words this minute. What nonsense you do talk, Mr. Parks. Not fit for children to listen to. Why, you'll be frightening Master Stephen there out of his wits. What, Master Stephen? said Parks, awaking to the consciousness of the boy's presence. Master Stephen knows well enough when I'm a-playing a, a joke with you, Mrs. Bunch. In fact, Stephen knew much too well to suppose that Mr. Parks had, in the first instance, intended a joke. He was interested, not altogether pleasantly, in the situation, but all his questions were unsuccessful in inducing the butler to give any more detailed account of his experiences in the wine cellar. We have now arrived at March 24th, 1812. It was a day of curious experiences for Stephen, a windy, noisy day which filled the house and the gardens with a restless impression. As Stephen stood by the fence of the grounds and looked out into the park, he felt as if an endless procession of unseen people were sweeping past him on the wind, borne on restlessly and aimlessly, vainly striving to stop themselves to catch at something that might arrest their flight and bring them once again into contact with the living world of which they had formed a part. After luncheon that day, Mr. Abney said, "'Stephen, my boy, do you think you can manage to come to me tonight as late as eleven o'clock in my study? I shall be busy until that time, and I wish to show you something connected with your future life, which it is most important that you should know.' You are not to mention this matter to Mrs. Bunch nor to anyone else in the house, and you'd better go to your room at the usual time. Here was a new excitement added to life. Stephen eagerly grasped at the opportunity of sitting up until eleven o'clock. He looked in at the library door on his way upstairs that evening and saw a brazier, which he had often noticed in the corner of the room, moved out before the fire, an old silver gilt cup stood on the table filled with red wine, and some written sheets of paper lay near it. Mr. Abney was sprinkling some incense on the brazier from a round silver box as Stephen passed, but did not seem to notice his step. The wind had fallen, and there was a still night and a full moon. At about ten o'clock, Stephen was standing at the open window of his bedroom, looking out over the country. Still as the night was, the mysterious population of the distant moonlit woods was not yet lulled to rest. From time to time, strange cries as of lost and despairing wanderers sounded from across the mere. They might be the notes of owls or water birds, yet they did not quite resemble either sound. Were not they coming nearer? Now they sounded from the nearer side of the water, and in a few moments they seemed to be floating about among the shrubberies. Then they ceased but just as Stephen was thinking of shutting the window and resuming his reading of Robinson Crusoe, he caught sight of two figures standing on the graveled terrace that ran along the garden side of the hall. The figures of a boy and a girl, as it seemed, they stood side by side looking up at the windows. Something in the form of the girl recalled irresistibly his dream of the figure in the bath. The boy inspired him with more acute fear. Whilst the girl stood still, half smiling, with her hands clasped over her heart, the boy, a thin shape with black hair and ragged clothing, raised his arms in the air with an appearance of menace and of unappeasable hunger and longing. The moon shone upon his almost transparent hands, and Stephen saw that the nails were fearfully long and that the light shone through them. As he stood with his arms thus raised, he disclosed a terrifying spectacle. On the left side of his chest there opened a black and gaping rent, and there fell upon Stephen's brain, rather than upon his ear, the impression of one of those hungry and desolate cries that he'd heard resounding over the woods of Aswarby all that evening. In another moment this dreadful pair had moved swiftly and noiselessly over the dry grass, and he saw them no more. 
inexpressibly frightened as he was, he determined to take his candle and go down to Mr. Abney's study, for the hour appointed for their meeting was near at hand. The study or library opened out to the front hall on one side, and Stephen, urged on by his terrors, did not take long in getting there. To effect an entrance was not so easy. The door was not locked, he felt sure, for the key was on the outside of it, as usual. His repeated knocks produced no answer. Mr. Abney was engaged. He was speaking. What? Why did he try to cry out? And why was the cry choked in his throat? Had he, too, seen the mysterious children? But now everything was quiet, and the door yielded to Stephen's terrified and frantic pushing. On the table in Mr. Abney's study, certain papers were found, which explained the situation to Stephen Elliott when he was of an age to understand them. The most important sentences were as follows. It was a belief very strongly and generally held by the ancients, of whose wisdom in these matters I have had such experiences as induced me to place confidence in their assertions, that by enacting certain processes, which to us moderns have something of a barbaric complexion, a very remarkable enlightenment of the spiritual faculties in man may be attained, that, for example, by absorbing the personalities of a certain number of his fellow creatures, an individual may gain complete ascendancy over those orders of spiritual beings which control the elemental forces of our universe. It is recorded of Simon Magnus that he was able to fly in the air, to become invisible or to assume any form he pleased by the agency of the soul of a boy whom, to use the libelous phrase employed by the author of the Clementine Recognitions, he had murdered. I find it set down, moreover, with considerable details in the writings of Hermes Trismegistus that similar happy results may be produced by the absorption of the hearts of not less than three human beings below the age of twenty-one years. To the testing of the truth of this receipt, I have devoted the greater part of the last twenty years, selecting as the corpora vilia of my experiment such persons as could conveniently be removed without occasioning a sensible gap in society. The first step I effected by the removal of one Phoebe Stanley, a girl of gypsy extraction, on March 24, 1792. The second by the removal of a wandering Italian lad named Giovanni Paoli on the night of March 23, 1805. The final victim, to employ a word repugnant in the highest degree to my feelings, must be my cousin, Stephen Elliott. His day must be this March 24, 1812. The best means of effecting the required absorption is to remove the heart from the living subject, to reduce it to ashes, and to mingle them with about a pint of red wine, preferably port. The remains of the first two subjects, at least, it will be well to conceal, a disused bathroom or wine cellar will be found convenient for such a purpose. Some annoyance may be experienced from the psychic portion of the subjects, which popular language dignifies with the name of ghosts. But the man of philosophic temperament, to whom alone the experiment is appropriate, will be little prone to attach importance to the feeble efforts of these beings to wreak their vengeance on him. I contemplate with the liveliest satisfaction the enlarged and emancipated existence which the experiment, if successful, will confer on me, not only placing me beyond the reach of human justice, so-called, but eliminating to a great extent the prospect of death itself. Mr. Abney was found in his chair, his head thrown back, his face stamped with an expression of rage, fright, and mortal pain. In his left side was a terrible, lacerated wound, exposing the heart. There was no blood on his hands, and a long knife that lay on the table was perfectly clean. A savage wildcat might have inflicted the injuries. The window of the study was open, and it was the opinion of the coroner that Mr. Abney had met his death by the agency of some wild creature. But Stephen Elliott's study of the papers that I have quoted led him to a very different conclusion.
Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… The story of Queen Esther is chilling, full of an Iroquois warrior woman's quest for vengeance, brutal warfare, haunting legends, ghostly wails, and a curse that many believe still has power even today. No one can remember exactly when the ghost story began, but records show it dates back to at least 1926. The tale centers around the administration offices of Rockford School District 205 on South Madison Street, formerly Rockford High School. Built in 1885, the school gained a spooky reputation due to eerie events reported in its underground tunnels. After a tragic accident in the school's swimming pool claimed the life of a student named Gosta Anderson, strange sightings and sounds fueled the legend of his restless spirit, haunting the very site where he died. Plumas County, California holds a chilling mystery that dates back to 1978. On a winter night with a half-moon, five friends left a basketball game at California State University Chico and drove away, never to be seen again. Their car was found abandoned on a remote mountain road, leading to a series of eerie discoveries, unanswered questions, and clues that still baffle investigators today. But first, Victorian-era ghosts. They seem to haunt not only our imaginations, but also our Halloween wardrobes. Why were people in the mid to late 1800s so obsessed with the supernatural? And why are we so fascinated by Victorian ghost stories still today? We begin there. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear my other podcasts, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. When you search for ghost costumes online, you'll find three major categories. The first is a simple, white, flowing gown-type costume. Think classic white bedsheet. The second is pop culture ghosts, whether it's the murderer from the Scream movies, which wasn't even a ghost, but whatever, a Slimer from Ghostbusters, or a bold-striped Beetlejuice suit. But the third, the Victorian ghost, is more peculiar. It's ornate and complex, but it's not tied to any particular horror franchise or iconic ghost. So why does formal Victorian wear, like corsets and lace, feel so ghostly to us? The idea of a person's spirit interacting with the living world is ancient. For example, in the Hebrew Bible, there's a medium who claims to speak to the ghost of Samuel. However, we never actually see the ghost of Samuel saying boo at people. In Homer's Odyssey, characters visit the underworld and see ghosts, but that doesn't totally count as haunting. For a ghost to truly haunt, it must, at least partly, inhabit the land of the living. These underworld-dwelling ghosts are usually called shades rather than ghosts. Ghosts have featured in stories for centuries, but it wasn't until the Victorian and Edwardian eras that the ghost story as we know it became a hit. Kyra Cochran at The Guardian offers a great overview of the era's intense love for ghost stories, linking their popularity to technological advances. One major factor was the rise of the periodical press. Cochran writes, Ghost stories had traditionally been an oral form, but publishers suddenly needed a mass of content and ghost stories fitted the bill. Short, 
cheap, generic, repetitive, able to be cut quite easily to length. There were several very excellent and popular Victorian magazines, including one run by Charles Dickens, notes Jack Sullivan, a professor of English at Ryder University and the editor of the Penguin Encyclopedia of Horror and the Supernatural. While Dickens wasn't a genre writer like his contemporaries like Sheridan Le Fou and M. R. James, his story A Christmas Carol, published just before Christmas in 1843, is perhaps the best-known Victorian-era ghost story today. Sullivan points out that A Christmas Carol was published near the beginning of the Victorian Edwardian golden era of ghost stories. Note, I have narrated the entire novel, A Christmas Carol, and you can listen to it for free on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. I'll also place a link to it in the episode notes. Another reason for the boom in ghost stories during this time is a bit contradictory. The Victorian era is famous for huge leaps in technological development. This is the era that pioneered trains for quick movement of goods, created the telegraph for instantaneous long-distance communication, and developed gas power for efficient lighting. London's first sewage system was also built in the mid-1800s. The Victorian era was, quite frankly, terrifying. All of a sudden, magic seemed to become ordinary and tangible. Because so many things that seemed impossible were made very real in just a few decades, Victorians, despite being scientifically minded, had a deep love of magic and paranormal spectacles. Mediums and seances were fantastically popular, as were hypnotism shows. This isn't an isolated phenomenon. The past decade has also seen incredible technological advancements with high-speed internet, mobile communication devices, and Silicon Valley disrupting every aspect of our lives. In the future, people might look back on our era similar to how we view the Victorians, as people struggling to keep up with rapid technological change. And just as with the Victorians, there has been an explosion in the love of the supernatural. Sullivan explains that most ghost stories in Victorian periodicals were not accompanied by many illustrations. Surprisingly, there wasn't a consensus on how ghosts looked or dressed. It's usually something that's very ambiguous and shrouded, he says. The Victorians liked ghost stories that were hyper-realistic rather than scenes of fantasy. These were not world creation stories, they were designed to scare the reader. And what could be scarier than a realistic depiction of the world in which something totally unexplainable suddenly happens? Another simple reason for the Victorian era's love of ghost stories is the weather. Of course, bad weather is always good for ghosts and ghost stories, says Sullivan. Over time, the concept of the Victorian-dressed ghost, usually women in corsets and lace with many layered puffy dresses, sometimes wedding dress-like, or a male ghost in a formal coat with tails, solidified in popular culture. This is partly because the stories from the Victorian era were so good that they've been remade or referenced ever since. There has been a steady undercurrent of these stories, regardless of current horror trends. For example, in the 1970s, the BBC remade Lost Hearts in 1973, the story by M. R. James from 1904 that I opened up this episode with, and The Signalman in 1976 based on a Dickens ghost story from 1866. Note, The Signalman from Charles Dickens is another story I have narrated for the podcast. I'll link to that in the episode notes as well. The Victorian ghost story is one of those genres that became solidified very quickly, within just a few decades. Most later takes on the genre have to acknowledge it in some way. The same thing happened with film noir. It was so popular and codified during its heyday in the 1940s and early 1950s that any film noir now is often consciously and playfully dependent on tropes from that era. Think of Brick, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, or even Drive, which is more of a hard-boiled film. Similarly, much of the ghost stories that followed the Victorian era referenced their storytelling forefathers by incorporating specific tropes. Clothing is an easy one. Think of Nearly Headless Nick from the Harry Potter series, or the many references to the Victorian era in Lev Grossman's The Magicians series. Here's one from the first book in that series. Break Bills, the book's magical school, was largely dependent on Victorian-era technology. 
It wasn't an affection or not entirely electronics, Quentin was told, behaved unpredictably in the presence of sorcery. So it's not that ghosts always wear Victorian garb. It's that Victorian-era ghost stories have a significant influence on any supernatural storytelling in the English language canon that followed. Literature and film build on what came before, and that influence often shows itself in little nods, like a ghostly corset. Victorian ghost costumes might seem peculiar at first, but they have deep roots in the rich tradition of 19th century ghost stories. The Victorians' fascination with the supernatural, fueled by rapid technological advancements and a love for spooky tales, has left a lasting mark on how we imagine ghosts today. Whether through literature, film, or even Halloween costumes, the eerie elegance of Victorian ghosts continues to haunt our imaginations, reminding us of a time when the line between the possible and the impossible was thrillingly blurred. Coming up, Plumas County, California holds a chilling mystery that dates back to 1978. On a winter night with a half moon, five friends left a basketball game at California State University Chico and drove away, never to be seen again. Their car was found abandoned on a remote mountain road, leading to a series of eerie discoveries, unanswered questions, and clues that still baffle investigators today. But first, the story of Queen Esther is chilling, full of an Iroquois warrior woman's quest for vengeance, brutal warfare, haunting legends, ghostly wails, and a curse that many believe still has power even today. That story is up next on Weird Darkness. Anywhere and anything can be haunted, and many people from all walks of life experience strange things in surprising locations. As you will discover, the prettiest of places, the most innocent of places, and the most unexpected places can still be filled with supernatural forces and pure demonic malevolence. Haunted places, churches, hospitals, forests, the workplace, and more. Horrifying true tales of ghosts, demons, poltergeists, and the paranormal. Come and be chilled by people's creepy experiences with the supernatural in ordinary, everyday places. Warning, listening to this audiobook may increase nervousness. True Tales of Haunted Places by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. You're a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. A mall is a warhammer. In European history, it's often thought of as a medieval weapon. However, well into the 18th century, many indigenous people of North America used stone warhammers or mauls to protect their homeland from white settlers and to terrorize their enemies. In the quiet suburban town of Wyoming, Pennsylvania, in Luzerne County, which sits along the banks of the Susquehanna River about five miles north of Wilkes Bar, there's a large boulder known as Queen Esther's Rock, often simply called the Bloody Rock by locals. In the 1960s, a monument with a plaque was erected on this site by local historians to commemorate the supposed massacre of 14 Continental soldiers during the American Revolution. This massacre was said to have taken place on or near that site by a vengeful, maul-wielding Iroquois woman seeking retribution for what she perceived as the unjust murder of her son. The monument reads simply, The Bloody Rock. On the night of July 3rd, 1778, after the Battle of Wyoming, 14 or more captive American soldiers were murdered here by a mall wielded by a vengeful Indian woman, traditionally but not certainly identified as Queen Esther. The Iroquois woman may have gained vengeance for her son's death by smashing in heads with her stone warhammer. However, according to most accounts, 
the Continental Army of the United States eventually caught up with Queen Esther and her band of indigenous followers. She apparently ended her days swinging from a noose on a tree branch somewhere deep in the Pennsylvania woodland. To this day, it is said her ghost, with its mournful wailing, haunts Pennsylvania up and down the Susquehanna River as her restless spirit continues to seek vengeance for those who murdered her son and followers. But who was Queen Esther of the Iroquois people, according to history? And what happened between the American settlers in Pennsylvania and the Native Americans of the nearby environs to cause this tale of murder, revenge, and bloodshed that has led to one of America's most enduring hauntings? In order to find answers to these questions, we must first travel back to the town of Wyoming, Pennsylvania and look more deeply into the folklore surrounding this historical story. When it comes to Queen Esther and her ghost, all that can be said for certain is that nothing is really known for certain. Surprisingly, for such a small, seemingly innocuous place, the monument to Queen Esther's Bloody Rock is not the only historical marker that stands in Wyoming, Pennsylvania. Only a short distance away from Queen Esther's marker stands another plaque outside the Revolutionary War-era site of the old frontier Fort Wyoming which was fought over by American patriots and Tory forces loyal to the British Crown during the 1770s. This marker commemorates, more generally, the battle that took place in Wyoming, Pennsylvania on July 3, 1778, almost two years to the day after our national declared independence from Great Britain. It reads, Battle of Wyoming. Nearby, on July 3, 1778, 300 patriots under Colonel Zebulon Butler were defeated by 1,000 British Tories and their Indian allies under Major John Butler. Captives were murdered. Survivors fled to 40 Fort. Two Army officers, both named Butler, on opposing sides, one Patriot and one Tory, faced off with one another in a battle on July 3, 1778. Indigenous people, most likely Iroquois, sided with the British. The Tories and their Native American allies won, and the American prisoners who surrendered were murdered in cold blood. Often during the course of the American Revolution from the mid-1770s right up until hostilities ceased in 1784, control of the area along the banks of the Susquehanna River and the place then known as Fort Wyoming on the Pennsylvania frontier would change hands many times in fighting between Tories and Patriots. Bloody atrocities were committed in abundance on both sides, and unfortunately, Native American peoples were unjustly dragged into all of the European bloodshed. All of this most certainly happened, as did the pivotal battle on July 3, 1778, outside Wyoming, Pennsylvania, between Loyalist Tories and American Patriots. But did an Iroquois warrior woman nicknamed Queen Esther have anything to do with any of it at all? Maybe not. Many retellings of the story behind Queen Esther and her ghost have little to do with the American Revolution, other than the fact that most agree that something involving murder and revenge by an Iroquois woman occurred in the year 1778. The most common version of the origins behind what Pennsylvanians call Queen Esther's curse takes place way to the north of Fort Wyoming, outside the town of Sayre, Pennsylvania, which straddles the state's northern border with New York. The woodlands of northern Pennsylvania and New York State were in the heart of Iroquois land during America's War for Independence. This version of events claims that Queen Esther's son, supposedly a mere lad in his early teenage years at the time, was killed by a notorious town drunk from Sire, Pennsylvania, after an argument perhaps over some sort of bartering that went woefully wrong. What did happen outside of Sire, Pennsylvania is that on the night of September 27th, 1778, a raid was launched by a war party of Iroquois, supposedly under the command of the tomahawk-wielding Queen Esther in revenge for her son's murder. Two people, a farmer named Arthur Van Rossum and his wife Jane, were murdered and scalped by the Iroquois as revenge for the death of Queen Esther's son. In retaliation for this, in October 1778, a force of 200 Continental Army soldiers under the command of Colonel Thomas Hartley launched an attack on the Iroquois in search of Queen Esther. Though the details of this expedition are murky, Colonel Thomas Hartley was indeed a real Patriot military officer who was in command of the American militia from York, Pennsylvania during the American Revolution. 
After the war, he would go on to serve in the Pennsylvania State Legislature and was a well-known lawyer and respected politician in the early days of the American Republic. He did lead the Pennsylvania militia on an expedition up the Susquehanna River in the autumn of 1778 against marauding hostile Native American forces and Tory loyalists. However, whether he caught up with Queen Esther and her band of vengeful Iroquois is anyone's guess. Legend says that Hartley's column of 200 soldiers did indeed catch Queen Esther and her band of Iroquois warriors and that he had her watch as his soldiers massacred every man, woman, and child from her village before disposing of all of their lifeless corpses in the river. After massacring all the Iroquois, Colonel Hartley then, so the story goes, had the infamous Queen Esther hanged from a nearby tree before his column of Continental soldiers moved on down the Susquehanna. Contemporary reports claim that the screams of the murdered Iroquois could be heard all the way in the town of Athens, Pennsylvania, nearly ten miles from the site of the oak tree where Queen Esther was supposedly lynched. No matter what really happened, it's probably true that Colonel Thomas Hartley and his column of soldiers murdered scores of Iroquois men, women, and children in cold blood in retaliation for what they saw as a crime against their fellow patriots from Pennsylvania. According to a journal kept by an American soldier who was present at Queen Esther's lynching, the young queen of the Iroquois said as the noose was placed around her neck, may a curse be placed on the heads of any white men who dare set foot on this land. Thus was born the so-called Curse of Queen Esther. Within a decade of the supposed massacre and lynching, locals in the area reported hearing the sound of screams and mournful wailing coming from the woods around the oak tree where legend has it Queen Esther was lynched near Wyoming, as well as from the site of the Bloody Rock on the banks of the Susquehanna River. To this day, local residents report hearing the blood-curdling screams of the massacred indigenous Iroquois villagers at night. Also, hunters out in the woods routinely report seeing the floating apparition of a Native American woman carrying a stone maul, still seeking revenge on those who murdered her and her son. Dozens of hunters have reported that when they give chase or even fire off a shot at Queen Esther's ghost, she simply vanishes into thin air. Is any of this true? Who knows? But what is true is that the tales that gave rise to the story of Queen Esther's curse and her ghost are some of the most enduring and longest-lasting stories of the paranormal in American history. It is possible that Queen Esther's ghost still haunts the woodlands of Pennsylvania, but it is almost certain that the crimes Americans committed against one another during our war for independence continue to haunt our collective conscience as a nation to this very day. Ghostly specters notwithstanding. Plumas County, California. There was a half moon that night, a winter moon and a cloudless sky. Up in the mountains, above the Feather River, the snow drifts sometimes rose to fifteen feet. You need a coat, Ted Weir's grandmother had said, watching him go. Oh, Grandma, I don't need a coat, Weir had said. Not tonight. Two hours before midnight, on February 24, 1978, when the basketball game ended at the California State University at Chico, five young men from the flatlands 50 miles to the south climbed into a turquoise and white 1969 Mercury Montego and drove out of the parking lot. They were fans of the visiting team, which had won. They stopped three blocks away at Bears Market, mildly annoying the clerk who was trying to close up, and bought one Hostess cherry pie, one Langendorf lemon pie, one Snickers bar, one Marathon bar, two Pepsis, and a quart and a half of milk. Then they walked out of the store, got back in their car, drove south out of Chico, and disappeared. Ted Weir's mom woke up afraid at five the next morning. She could not say what woke her up, except that maybe the Lord decided it was time to end her one last night of solid sleep. Ted's bed was empty. The house was still, and it was not quite light, 
And this is how the horror began, as it often does. No crash, no wailing, just a dim, morning chill in a small house on what ought to be an ordinary day. Imogene Weir got on the phone and called Bill Sterling's mother as fast as she could. Juanita Sterling had been up since 2 a.m. Bill didn't come home either, she said. Mrs. Sterling had already called Jack Madruga's mother. Jack also had not come home. Mrs. Weir called Jackie Hewitt's mother, and Mrs. Weir's daughter-in-law walked down the street to talk to Gary Mathias's stepfather. All five friends had vanished. At eight that evening, Mrs. Madruga called the police. The boys had never done such a thing before. They were men, really, not boys. Hewitt was the youngest at 24, and Weir was 32, but their families called them boys, our boys. They lived at home. Three of the five had been diagnosed with mental disabilities, or as they impolitely worded it then, retarded. Madruga, although undiagnosed according to his mother, was generally thought of as slow, and Matthias was under drug treatment for schizophrenia, a psychotic depression that first appeared five years before and that his doctor says had not resurfaced for the past two years. They were supposed to play a basketball game of their own on February 25th, part of a tournament with a free week in Los Angeles, if they won. Their clothes had been laid out the evening of the 24th, before they left for Chico. Each had a beige t-shirt, the words Gateway Gators emblazoned across the chest from the Yuba City Vocational Rehabilitation Center for the Handicapped, where they all played basketball. Weir had asked his mother to wash his new white high-topped sneakers for the tournament. He had scuffed them while trying them out. Matthias had just about driven his mother crazy with the game. We got a big game Saturday, Matthias kept saying. Don't you let me oversleep. Saturday came and went, and no word came. The police began to take interest. On Tuesday, February 28th, they found Madruga's Mercury, and from that day on, nothing they found, nothing anybody told them, seemed to make any sense. The car was 70 miles from Chico, on a deserted and rut-ravaged mountain road. It had stopped at the snow line, and although its tires had apparently spun, the car was not really stuck. Five men easily could have pushed it free. The gas tank was a quarter full. Four maps, including one of California, lay neatly folded in the glove compartment. The keys were gone, but when police hotwired the car, the engine started immediately. Both seats were littered with the wrappers of the food bought at Bears. Everything had been eaten except the marathon bar, which was half gone. And the car's underside was undamaged. This heavy American car with a low-hanging muffler and presumably with five full-grown men inside had wound up on a stretch of torturously bumpy mountain road, apparently in total darkness, without a gouge or dent or thick mud stain to show for it. The driver had either used astonishing care and precision, the investigators figured, or else he knew the road well enough to anticipate every rut. The families say only Madruga drove that car, ever, and the families say Madruga, who disliked camping and hated the cold, did not know that road. None of the boys knew the road, as far as anybody could tell. Once, about eight years earlier, Bill Sterling had gone fishing with his father at a cabin not far away, but he had not enjoyed himself and had stayed home the few times the Sterlings went back. Three years back, Weir had hunted deer with friends in the Feather River country, but it was quite a way west of the area where the car was found, and his family says he was not keen on the forest either. With the exception of Matthias, who occasionally stayed out all night with friends, each of the lost men led mostly stay-at-home lives of such scheduled predictability that no one could fathom what or who might have taken them up that lonely road in the mountains. A storm whistled in the day the car was found, dropping nine inches of snow on the upper mountain. The search teams nearly lost men themselves two days later, as their snowcats struggled through the drifts. Nobody found anything, not so much as a shoe, until after the spring thaw, when on June 4th a small group of Sunday motorcyclists wandered into a deserted Forest Service trailer camp at the end of the road and inhaled a nauseating smell. It was Ted Weir, stretched out on a bed inside the main 60-foot trailer, frozen to death. Eight sheets had been pulled over his body and tucked around his head. 
His leather shoes were off and missing. A table by the bed held his nickel ring with the name Ted engraved on it, his gold necklace, his wallet with cash inside, and a gold Waltham watch, its crystal missing, which the families say had not belonged to any of the five men. Weir had been a tall, heavy-set follow-back in February. Five feet eleven, two hundred pounds. By the time his body was found, he had lost from eighty to a hundred pounds. His feet were badly frostbitten. The growth of beard on his face showed that he had lived, apparently, in starving agony inside that trailer for anywhere from eight to thirteen weeks. He was 19.4 miles from the car. Weir, wearing a striped velour shirt and lightweight green pants, had walked or ran or been somehow taken in the moonlight through almost 20 miles of four to six foot snowdrifts to reach the locked trailer where he died. The trailer had been broken into through a window. No fire had been built, although matches were lying around, and there were paperback novels and wood furniture that would have burned easily. More than a dozen sea ration cans from an outside storage shed had been opened and emptied. One had been opened with an Army P-38 can opener, which only Madruga and Matthias, who had served in the Army, probably knew how to use. But no one had opened a locker in the same shed containing enough dehydrated Mexican dinners and fruit cocktails and assorted other meals to keep all five alive for a year. No one had touched the propane tank in another shed outside, either. All they had to do was turn that gas on, says Yuba County Lieutenant Lance Ayers, and they'd have had gas to the trailer and heat. All through the spring, the search for the boys had practically consumed Ayers. He'd gone to Marysville High School with Weir and his brothers, although he had not known them well, and there was something about this silent disappearance of five strong men that haunted him like nothing he had ever investigated. Leads were drifting in from all parts of the country. The boys had been seen in Ontario. The boys had been seen in Tampa. The boys had been seen entering a movie theater in Sacramento accompanied by an older man. Ayers could punch holes in all of them. Skeptical but desperate, he consulted psychics. One told him the boys had been kidnapped to Arizona and Nevada. Another said the boys had been murdered in Oroville, in a two-story red house, brick or stained wood, with a gravel driveway and the numbers 4723 or 4753. For two solid days, Ayers drove every street in Oroville looking for that house. It did not exist. Before long, he could rattle off their names and vital statistics almost automatically. Theodore Earl Weir, brown eyes, curly brown hair, handsome, beer-bellied, friendly in a trusting child's way. He waved at strangers and brooded for hours if they did not wave back. Got a good chuckle out of phoning Bill Sterling and reading from newspaper items or oddball names from the telephone book. Employed for a while as a janitor and snack bar clerk, but quit at the urging of his family, who thought Weir's slowness was causing problems. Jackie Charles Hewitt, 24, 5 feet 9, 160 pounds, slight droop to the head, slow to respond, a loving shadow to Weir, who looked after Hewitt in a protective sort of way and would dial the phone for him when Hewitt had to make a call. Jack Anton Madruga, 5 foot 11, 190 pounds, high school graduate and army veteran, brown eyes, brown hair, heavy set, laid off in November from his job as a busboy for Sunsweet Growers. William Lee Sterling, 5 foot 10, 170 pounds, dark brown hair, blue eyes, Madruga's special friend, deeply religious, would spend hours at the library reading literature to help bring Jesus to patients in mental hospitals. Gary Dale Mathias, 5 feet 10, 170 pounds, brown hair, hazel eyes, 25, assistant in his stepfather's gardening business, army veteran with psychiatric discharge after drug problems that developed in Germany five years ago. By late spring, Ayers was dreaming about the boys at night. Once he woke in the darkness, arms outstretched, he had almost embraced all five. You do a lot of handshaking, Ayers says, and a lot of drinking. Then there was the man who saw lights on the road. Joseph Shones, 55, told police he drove his Volkswagen bug up that same road sometime after 5.30 the evening the boys disappeared. He said he was checking the snow line because he wanted to bring his wife and daughter up that weekend. His car got stuck in the snow just above the snow line, about 50 yards beyond the place where the mercury would be found. 
and as Shones was trying to free his car, he said he had a heart attack. Doctors later confirmed to investigators that Shones had indeed suffered a mild heart attack. Shones lay in the car with engine on and the car heater going, and sometime in the night he heard what he described as whistling noises a little way down the road, and he got out of his car. What he saw looked like a group of men and a woman with a baby, he said, walking in the glare of a vehicle's headlights. He thought he heard them talking. Shones said he yelled for help, but the headlights went out and the talking stopped. Shones got back into his car and lay down again, he said. Sometime later, maybe a couple hours, he saw lights outside his car window, flashing beams, he said. Again, he called for help. The lights went out, and whoever was out there went away. Shones said he lay in the car until it ran out of gas, and then, while it was still dark, he walked back eight miles to the lodge called Mountain House, where he had stopped for a drink before heading up the road. Just below his Volkswagen, in the place where he had heard the voices, he passed the Mercury Montego, sitting empty in the middle of the road. The day after Weir's body was discovered, searchers found the remains of Madruga and Sterling. They lay on opposite sides of the road to the trailer, 11.4 miles from the car. Madruga had been partially eaten by animals and dragged about 10 feet to a stream. He lay, face up, his right hand curled around his watch. Sterling was in a wooded area scattered over about 50 feet. There was nothing left of him but bones. Two days later, just off the same road but much closer to the trailer, Jackie Hewitt's father found his son's backbone. Ayers had tried to talk him out of joining the search, fearing something like that might happen, but Hewitt, whose first name is Jack, had insisted on going. There were a few other bones around, along with Jackie's Levi's and ripple-soled Get There's shoes. An assistant sheriff from Plumas County found a skull the next day, about a hundred yards downhill from the rest of the bones. The family dentist identified the teeth as those of Jackie Hewitt. Hewitt's remains had lain northeast of the trailer, like Sterling's and Madruga's. Northwest of the trailer, about a quarter mile away, searchers found three wool Forest Service blankets and a two-cell flashlight lying by the side of the road. The flashlight was slightly rusted and had been turned off. It was impossible to tell just how long it had been there. They found no sign of Gary Mathias. His tennis shoes were inside the Forest Service trailer, which suggested to investigators that he might have taken them off to put on Weir's leather shoes, particularly since Weir had bigger feet and Matthias's feet might have swollen with frostbite. But that was pure conjecture, which was all they had. State mental institutions received a description of Matthias. Slender, dark-haired, double vision without his glasses. He was not carrying his billfold when he left the house for the Chico basketball game, so he had no identification on him, and if he was still alive, He'd been without the drugs he needed for the last four months. Matthias took his medicine weekly, as he had for at least three years, Stelazine and Cogentin, both used in the treatment of schizophrenia. His family says the illness appeared five years before, while he was in the army in Germany. Police records show he'd become violent on occasion, he was charged with assault twice, and there was a difficult period after his return from Germany when Matthias would fail to take his drugs and lapse into a disoriented psychosis that usually landed him in a Veterans Administration hospital. Went haywire is how Bob, his stepfather, put it. For years, Matthias had been working steadily in his stepfather's business and was taking his medication so faithfully that a local doctor who knows Matthias well called him one of our sterling success cases. He collected Army psychiatric disability pay, was enormously attached to his family, loved the basketball games he shared with the other four men, and listened to the Rolling Stones and Olivia Newton-John on the record player in the living room. Clough says his stepson took his medicine the week he disappeared, but he and the doctor say Matthias had not gone haywire in a couple of years. What I looked for all the time I was up there were his glasses, said Clough. I didn't think the bear would eat that. He's sitting at his dining room table. His voice is gruff. He's tired of reporters and tired of the pain and tired of not understanding what happened to the boy. Ida Klopf, across the table from him, says she had not turned on her television in weeks because she does not want to find out that way. She says she's going back up there on the weekend, back up to see if she can find something the searchers missed. There's no place to look, Ida, says Klopf. 
I'll find something, Mrs. Clough says, turning her face away. Bizarre, says John Thompson, the special agent from the California Department of Justice who joined Ayers on the investigation. And no explanations, and a thousand leads. Every day you've got a thousand leads, he said. They learned that a Forest Service snowcat ran up the road to the trailer on February 23rd, leaving a packed path in the snow that the boys might have followed. They took on a water witcher from the town up north called Paradise, who said that he had fixed it so his divining rod would pick up traces of human minerals and then led the searchers to a deserted cabin near the abandoned car. They found a gray cigarette lighter, the disposable, plastic kind, about three-quarters of a mile northwest of the trailer. The families said none of the boys carried lighters. They found that gold watch beside Weir's body. They discovered that Gary Mathias knew people in Forbes Town, which is about halfway between Chico and Yuba Cities, on a road with a turnoff so easy to miss that anybody driving it late at night might have ended up heading north toward the mountains and lost. But none of it helped. The cabin found by the water witcher was empty. The cigarette lighter might have been dropped by a hiker. The watch might have belonged to a forest ranger in the trailer months earlier, and Matthias's friends in Forbes Town said they had not seen him for over a year. And suppose they followed the snowcat's tracks. Suppose that was how Weir made it through 20 miles of deep snow. Why? Why abandon a perfectly operable car to strike out into the forest at midnight? Why press on through 20 miles of snowdrifts and darkness to break into a locked, unheated trailer and die? Why drive all the way up there in the first place, and how? If someone chased them, why was the car undamaged? What were the whistling noises and the voices Shones heard on the road? It doesn't add up. There was some force that made him go up there, Jack Madruga's mother Mabel says firmly. They wouldn't have fled off in the wood like a bunch of quail. We know good and well that somebody's made them do it. We can't visualize someone getting the upper hand on those five men, but we know it must have been. They seen something at that game, at the parking lot, says Ted Weir's sister-in-law. They might have seen it and didn't even realize they seen it. I can understand why Gary would have been that scared, says Klops. Even a fire, he says. All those paperbacks, and they didn't even build a lousy fire. I can't understand why they didn't do that unless they were afraid. But he couldn't imagine what they were afraid of. Neither could investigators. They couldn't prove there was foul play, and they still can't explain it if there wasn't. They don't even know if Gary Mathias is dead. They think he is. They think his body probably lay on the snow until the spring thaw came and eased him down, deep inside some thick green patch of mountain manzanita. When Weird Darkness returns, a tragic accident in a school's swimming pool claims the life of a student, leading to the strange sightings and sounds haunting the school ever since. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. No one can remember how far back the following ghost story goes. Research shows that the story goes back at least until 1926. The ghost story was about the administration offices of Rockford School District 205, located on South Madison Street. It was originally the Rockford High School, also known as the Rockford Central High School. It was definitely not where one would imagine ghosts would linger. 
It was built and opened in 1885 as the first school built by the newly founded Rockford School District No. 205. It served as the Rockford High School from 1885 until 1940 when it was developed into the administration offices. The number of students grew beyond its capacity in 1935, so it was once again decided to build two new high schools. There would once again be an East High School and a West High School. East still continues as a high school while West is now a middle school. The Rockford Central High consisted of two buildings which were connected by a tunnel. There were lockers located in these tunnels and a maintenance office, according to witness stories, and a shop area where the male students would use the machines to make certain projects. The students would use the tunnels to pass between the buildings and attend shop class. Through the years, the tunnels got a reputation for being dark and rat-infested. It soon earned the nickname Rat Alley. The maintenance men started to talk about the strange happenings along this tunnel and in the lower area. Lights would flicker and then go off completely, plunging the whole area into darkness. There were also unexplainable sounds. There would be the sounds of doors slamming when no doors were being opened or shut. There was also moaning and the sounds of someone choking. And perhaps the scariest of all, shadows would be seen here. One story claimed that a maintenance worker was in the tunnel late. Everyone else had left the school, or so the man thought. But he heard sounds coming from the end of the tunnel. He shone his light into the darkness and saw a shadow form of a man. He called out to ask who was there, but got no answer. He thought that the shadow might be something playing tricks with his eyes, so he walked closer. He could see the shadow quite clearly then and realized there was nothing in that location that would make the human-like shadow on the wall. He was walking closer when suddenly the shadow suddenly moved and darted around the corner into the darkness. This time the man didn't follow it. It really startled him and he decided to go back toward the lighted area. As he turned his back to that part of the tunnel, he heard a young man's voice call out something to him from the darkness. He couldn't make out the words. He said, I just felt the need to get out of there. The legend part of the story stated that someone had drowned in the pool area in the past, and people felt that either the boy didn't know he was dead or he was angry that no one helped him. There are many times when the specifics to a legend can't stand up under the research. This story was different. Gosta and his twin brother, Folk Anderson, immigrated to America from Sweden in 1924. It seemed like an omen to the two boys that they arrived on July 4th. They traveled to Rockford, Illinois from New York. The two boys were sent to live with their uncle, Carl Anderson, and their aunt, Anna. Gosta was enrolled at the Rockford High School in February, transferring from Brown School. On March 3, 1925, during his gym class, Gosta would be killed in a tragic accident. Though there were at least ten other boys in the pool, no one saw Gosta jump into the pool and strike his head. No one saw as his body sank to the bottom of the pool. It would be 43 minutes before a student that was on the swim team, T. Horrell, noticed Gosta's body on the bottom of the pool. Horrell shouted to his coach, Tom Poole, and then dove in and brought Gosta's body to the surface. Police were immediately called and they worked on the boy for almost two hours as the boys from the gym class helplessly watched. At first, they didn't know the identity of the boy who they tried to revive. They found his identification in the locker room and his twin brother Folk was the first to identify Ghost's body. Two coaches, Byer and Poole, joined officers Addington and Conklin as they worked on the boy. But their efforts were in vain. Ghost was pronounced dead by Coroner Fred C. Olson. The police and school administrators questioned the boys that had come into the pool area during the time that Gosta's body must have been in the pool. Some of the boys remembered seeing Gosta on the diving board and watched as he went off the diving board backward. There were no signs that Gosta was in any trouble after his dive. The students and coaches all stated that they didn't see any thrashing or signs that anyone was in trouble. In the end, there was no clear answers to Gosta's death. This case caused a huge controversy about whether there was any negligence by the coaches or the other students. Mayor J. Henry Hallstrom called for an inquest and swore that if there was any sign of negligence that the coach would be fired. The autopsy showed that Gosta had a bruise on his forehead and no water in his lungs. 
At the end of the inquest, there was no proof that the coaches showed any negligence in Gosta's death. Gosta's body was released to his aunt and uncle. They took him to the Scandinavian cemetery for burial, and that should have been the end of the story. But shortly after Gosta's death, the stories began to circulate that students and maintenance workers were seeing and hearing things in the tunnels below the Rockford High School. Some theories about paranormal activity include the belief that if a person dies suddenly and unexpectedly, that they might not realize that they're dead. There's also the belief that maybe if some part of Gosta was aware of what was happening, that he might have thought someone would help him. And then, as no one came to help, Gosta might have grown confused and then angry that no one came to save him. The Rockford High School was torn down and a parking lot now exists where the building once stood. Only more investigation will tell if Gosta still continues to haunt the area where he died. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. Also on the site, you can visit the store for Weird Darkness t-shirts, mugs, and other merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories on Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories, authors, and sources I used in the episode notes. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 16, verse 17. The highway of the upright avoids evil. He who guards his way guards his life. And a final thought. Your existence is not accidental. Your skills are not incidental. God shaped your destiny, so don't settle for someone else's story. Max Licato I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Will NASA help Scotland search for the Loch Ness Monster? Is it possible that time doesn't really exist? Can you find true love and marriage with a ghost? How can a pothole revive the dead? These are just some of the questions I have in my new YouTube series, Mind of Marlar. It's full of the strange and macabre as you'd expect from my Weird Darkness podcast, but with an added twist of humor, satire, and absurdity. If you like comedy and creepiness, check out Mind of Marlar on YouTube or visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Mind of Marlar. Hey, weirdos! Be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com listen.